Thanks. I'm, I'm so excited to be here. Everyone give a round of applause for Hawk Fillsworth. Is that not it? That's it. Um, okay, so before we get started, um, I recently taught my stepkids how to troll. This is ill-advised. Um, <laughs> lately, they found out that I don't like the sound of my own voice, so they've been playing my conference videos every time I walk out of the room and I can't turn it off. So, Megan, if you're doing that right now, stop. <laughs> Great. Today, we're going to talk about the state of Jamstack Nation. In many ways, the iPhone was not original. These concepts, everything that it was comprised of existed before. The phones at the time had keyboards, they could email people, the iPod existed to store songs, internet browsing was possible on mobile. The iPhone didn't create something out of nothing. So, three things. A widescreen iPod with touch controls, a revolutionary mobile phone, and a breakthrough internet communications device. An iPod, a phone, <laughs> and an internet communicator. An iPod, <laughs> a phone. Are you getting it? These are not three separate devices. This is one device. And we are calling it iPhone. Today, today, Apple is going to reinvent the phone. What it did was combine many pieces of functionality into one easy to use device. One device that was so powerful, but so simple that it reduced the bar barrier to entry to almost nothing. It did all of this, but it was still something that you could hold in your hands and feel like it was sophisticated. It didn't pander in any of its ab abstractions. So what does it take to make something new and elegant out of things that exist already? How do we create a seismic shift out of things that existed before? So let's look at the history of Ethernet and subsequently Wi-Fi. Before Ethernet, uh, there was a series of net, which is a series of networks. There were token ring networks, and they're explicitly planned systems. So the packets are lined up and coordinated, and you can think about that a little bit like kindergarten when you have a talking stick, and you pass the talking stick to the next person, so you speak, and then you talk, and then you pass it along, and then the next person speaks, and so on and so forth. What Ethernet did was question this. What if we don't wait? What if we use an emergent system where computers can do the same thing at the same time, and if it sees another computer speaking, it will back off, just kind of like normal communication? And this system might seem chaotic, but actually it was really effective. And this kind of harked back to Aloha Net, and they used radio waves for Aloha Net. And its, its creators used the term ether because they wanted to evoke that presence in physics where like everything is omnipresent and it's passive and that you're going everywhere at the same time. So what changed here was not a fundamental rebuild of the entire technology stack, right, top to bottom. That's not what happened. Just like the iPhone, what happened here in this groundbreaking shift that allowed for so much communication across the planet and it boiled down to people rethinking the base premise. You might see where I'm going with this. When I hear people curious about Jamstack, which is you know, JavaScript, APIs, and markup, they'll say things like, well, but all of this existed before. Someone did a poll where they were like, what do you think Jamstack is? And someone said, I'm confused by the question. Serverless APIs are just APIs, and JavaScript is everywhere, so isn't that the term for a normal website? This intermingling of JavaScript APIs and markup has been present in the industry for a very long time. So what's the difference? To see where this shift occurred, what we have to do is revisit what came before it. Previously, in order to build web experiences, we create something like this. And this is still how it works, under the hood. But the new direction of computing is headed towards elegant abstractions. And when we're using a Jamstack model for development, this becomes this. 
And dynamic content, well, that's abstracted as well. And now we have serverless functions or functions as a service to create rich server-side experiences. People don't think of static as having dynamic functionality, but it totally does. It can completely have that. So what is the shift here? Jamstack is a modern architecture where we can create fast and secure sites and dynamic apps with JavaScript APIs and markup <laughs> I, I love these keynote transitions, sorry. Served without web, web servers. And that's really the crux of it, right? Jamstack can include any of JavaScript APIs and markup, but it doesn't need to, right? The important part is that it's served without web servers. It doesn't need those three things to qualify. You see, where previously we built from the ground up, Jamstack questions what the ground is. <laughs> Previously, we focused on what the stack contained, and the paradigm shift here is abstraction. <laughs> we no longer talk about operating systems, specific web servers, backend programming languages, databases, not about specific technologies. We're solving a lot of the same problems, and abstraction can be really useful when we spend a lot of time doing the same thing again and again. So now we have a new way of building websites and apps that delivers better performance, better security, lower cost of scaling, and a better developer experience. My name's Sarah Drasner. I'm Sarah Edo on Twitter. I work for CSS Tricks. I'm on the Vue core team, and I'm head of developer experience at Netlify, which is, yeah, which is, <laughs> which is not Netflix or Shopify, as, as confusing as that is for my parents. Um, <laughs> and I'm so pleased to be here today to talk about this monumental shift in this industry and how it can empower all of us to create beautiful experiences on the web. Okay, so we mentioned before that Jamstack is particularly known for static sites. And what's often missed in this definition is that that concept of static can actually be dynamic. So take this e-commerce site that I built, for instance. This is built with Nuxt and Netlify and uses Netlify functions to connect to Stripe to process payments. Now, just because it's built with Nuxt in view and Netlify doesn't mean that that's the only way we could write this in order to qualify as Jamstack. Um, and you can see here, I'm like adding things to a cart, and then I'm adding another thing to a cart. And then if we go to that cart, you can see here that I actually have a form where I can process these payments. And this is all available online. You can actually go to this URL and play with it. And there's like the fake credit card number there. You can see it's loading, it's processing, and then it's received, and then it clears the cart. So, in fact, Jamstack can be built with Nuxt, as you see, with Vue, Next with React, Gatsby, Eleven D, Jekyll, Hugo, more and more. This is not even a restriction. There's just tons of things that you can build Jamstack experiences with. And that's not all. There's many CMS options as well, like Contentful, Forestry, Sanity, Netlify CMS, Craft CMS, Decoupled WordPress, decoupled Drupal, and more and more. This is just a really, really rich ecosystem. So if, for those of you curious how static and Jamstack can make functionality as rich as an e-commerce store, let's dig in. So here's a bird's eye view of that project. You might not be able to see it, but there's like a line going through. These are all the things that are in the app in this like slow, steady curve on the bottom. So all of those tiny pieces are dot .view components. Dot .view components are single file components, and I'll show you what that looks like in a second. So pages are view components, components are view components, layouts are view components. The Vuex store is just a JavaScript file. That's like the brains of the matter. So it's kind of like Redux if you've ever used React. It holds all the state for the application. And then that Netlify function we're going to talk about in a minute, and we're going to communicate to Stripe. So if you're not familiar with view single file components, this is what they look like. In the template, we have all of our HTML. In the script, we have all of our, you know, anything dynamic, anything with script. And with the style, you can, uh, you can add this scope tag. You don't have to. It's uh, optional. But when you add the scope tag, all of the styles are scoped to the components. So it's a little bit... Uh, close to how we used to work with um, CSS modules. So all of those things are self-contained in that dot view component, and you, 
there's not a lot of context switching. You can work between all of those things. So when you're working with Next, you use a CLI tool to spin up this kind of whole kind of template area. And you'll be given an index page in the pages directory. Any view file that you put in the pages directory becomes a page and it will automatically route everything for you, which is really nice. So it has server-side rendering, code splitting, automatic routing, page transitions right out of the box. So you're given an index page in the pages directory. If you create a simple view file with a next link, create a duplicate and have the links point to each other, you get this, which is a single with a fully routed server-side rendered uh, application that's already ready to go and without ever stepping outside of a view file, which is how we normally write components anyway. Cool. So then if we log into Netlify, we can go find that repo. So I've you know, added it to a repo, with, which Next will already you know, kind of help you create. It already has, does a git in, git in it for you. And so I can find that repo right there, and I can create a new site, and I'm going to deploy from master. I'm going to say yarn generate as my build command. I'm going to say the dist folder in order to create that. And with that, not only is it fully routed, server-side rendered, and deployed, but we also set up a CI-CD pipeline automatically. So now every time I push to master, this is going to automatically be updated. Cool. We've already done a lot, and that was not a lot of code. OK, so now let's turn our attention to the function. So if we're working with this function, maybe you can see the line. So the Netlify function will live within our app, and it's going to communicate over to Stripe. So before we do that, let's talk about what we need just to have a Netlify function at all. Our very basic function looks like this. I stored mine in a folder called functions uh, and gave it a name of index.js. You can call it whatever you want. Um, we'll also need to create a netlify.toml, and really that will point to whatever folder that I'm using. So if I decided to call this the lambda folder, I would point to lambda here in the string. So here I'm going to give a very normal log message, which is, hi there, tacos, as you do, and um, also log the event. And if we push to master and go back to the Netlify dashboard, we're going to see that function right there already. And you can, you can see the endpoint there as well. So now if we hit that endpoint that it provides us, we'll see this. We'll see the message that says, hi there, tacos, and we'll see all of the event um, and so we're done with our first function. That was all, we already made our first serverless function. The thing to understand about serverless functions is it's not so different from the JavaScript that you write every day if you haven't used them before. It's literally a JavaScript function that you're executing on the server that executes a bit of event-driven logic. So okay, let's work on hooking up to Stripe now. So first, we're going to go into the Stripe dashboard and get our keys. For anyone scandalized by this, these are my testing keys. It's OK. You can use them. It's no big deal. <laughs> um, so we're going to get our keys. And you can see the publishable key and the secret key right there. So first, we're going to install a package called .env, where we store our key. And then we'll, use the, we'll store a, our key to a Stripe variable for, um, and say Stripe secret key. But you could actually call that anything, right? That's kind of industry standard of what we use to describe that. So process.env uh, .stripe secret key. Then if we go back into the Net Netlify dashboard, you can see that we go into build and deploy, continuous deployment, and environment environment variables, and we set, it has to be the same name, right? Stripe secret key, and then we can put our key right in there. Cool. Now we're not storing that in our Git repo. So if people are like committing to the Git repo, they don't have access to all of those things. OK, so now we'll really make our function. We'll make sure that we handle the case that the HTTP method is not what we're expecting. And then we'll also get some information, um, and then we'll also uh, deal with when we don't have information, missing information. And you can already see here that the data that we're going to be sending to Stripe. So we're checking what we don't have at this point, but we're going to use this in a second. So we'll need the token, the total amount, and a word I can't pronounce, which is endemidency. And something like that. <laughs> but what's not important is whether or not I can pronounce it. What's important is that it allows us to safely um, retry 
um, requests without accidentally performing the same action twice. So this is useful when an API call is disrupted, if there's like a network error or something like that. So that's an, a nice thing that we're providing with Stripe. So now we'll, stri we'll kick off the Stripe payment processing. We'll create a Stripe customer first, and then we'll use an, API, an email and a token for that, and then we'll create the Stripe charge. And for the Stripe charge, what they're expecting us to show is the currency that it's expecting, the amount, the receipt email, the customer ID, and the description. Cool. After that, we're going to log that it's successful, and not shown here, we'll do some erroring as well. So if we look back at our application, you can see that we have pages and components that live inside the pages. And we're going to connect to that Stripe function using this VX, Vuex store. So again, if you're used to Redux, similar kind of concept. This is where, this is kind of like the brains of the operation. So we're not going to have the client, all of the components do all of that. We're going to commit to the store or dispatch to the store and let the, the store do all of that. Great. And so, but we still have to have those things on the client, right? We need to have the form. We need to be able to accept the credit card data from someone. And that will all happen in appcard.view. So here, remember we had that payment processing. So this is what we're talking about right now, is this like filling out this part, this little form detail, this loading state, and success. And in order to create something that's embedded into the page, because you might have used Stripe before where you have this like little button and it goes to a modal and then it's a little Stripe detail thing, but that's Stripe's UI, right? And so sometimes when you're working on an e-commerce site, you don't want Stripe's UI popping up in your face. You want to embed the form into the page and make it look like the rest of the site so it feels natural, it feels like your site. And in order to do that, you'll use a thing called Stripe Elements. So I've tried a bunch of different ones that integrate with Vue. The one that I like the most is Vue Stripe Elements Plus. That's a really, really nice one. And what happens is they give us a card and some boilerplate to work with. And it looks a little bit like this. So this is the kind of HTML which is bound in a couple of places with directives. So we've got, you know, the place for email, we've got, you know, the card component, and there we're adding in that, you know, Stripe key, one of the Stripe keys. And then we're also going to have a button that has a pay method. That pay method is really important. As soon as you click that button, you know, after you've filled out the form, that pay method is what's going to execute all the logic for us to start to do things with our serverless function. So if we go into the app card .view, that pay method, you can see that create token actually resolves in a promise, and we're going to dispatch that to the store. We're going to send it over to the Vuex store so it can process all of it and send it to the function. In the Vuex store itself, you can see that we're hitting that endpoint. Remember, that was that first endpoint where we saw hello tacos or whatever. Um, and so we're hitting that endpoint and we're passing in all the data it was expecting. So the email, the amount, the token, the indemnity. Um, somebody teach me how to say that later. Um, and then, you know, that way we can do all of the, that kind of logic. Also, one kind of small note, sometimes I see people holding the UI, I have the UI status, which means like whether or not it's idle, whether or not it's loading, whether or not it's successful, the payment's successful, whether or not the payment is a failure. Sometimes people use Booleans for that, and I'll use one single value that I'm storing as a string, because I find that it's very, very rare that a UI kind of UX situation where it's only two states. You know, usually it's more than that. And then if, it's, if you're using Booleans, you have to check multiple things. So in this case, I'm updating it to success. I also have a loading state, which where you saw the loader. I have a failure state. I have an idle state. Um, so storing it as a string can be super helpful. That's not really the serverless function point, but side note. Okay, and so we try to do this in the dashboard. We try to do this on our deployed site, and what we have is a success. We log into the Stripe dashboard, and we see the successful payment. We have a customer. It's exactly the amount that we were expecting, and we set it all up. We just set up an e-commerce store with Stripe serverless and deployed, created a CI-CD pipeline, and it wasn't even that complicated. We did that in like 10 minutes. That's so cool. 
with such a low barrier to entry, you can see how you can make something really special and surprising without an, in, in, without an expensive infrastructure, you know? We just did that in 10 minutes, it's super awesome. Uh, so we ran through that all pretty quickly. If you'd like to play with the code or fork it and make it your own, you can make your own e-commerce store out of this or what have you. Um, you can go ahead and grab it. The, the demo is in that repo. Um, and, oh, actually the demo <laughs> should be on top. Those are switched. You get the point. Um, you can go to those two URLs and play with the code as you like. Cool. So we've now seen that aside from Jamstack being really fun, it's centered around a developer-friendly Git-based uh, Git workflow. It's designed modularly, consuming other services as APIs. It's pre-built and optimized before being served. And it's globally dis distributed and resilient to heavy traffic. But those are all the developer experience things, which I super get down with, but like, there also needs to be business implications of this too. So what are the business implications of moving to this kind of tech stack? One thing is that it has way better performance. And you've probably seen all of the data around better performance, but you know, kind of the TLDR is that if customers are waiting too long on your site, they're gonna bounce, and then they're not your customers, right? So better performance is super, super valuable if you're trying to make money. It has reduced operations costs. You don't have a whole dev DevOps team taking care of all of those pieces for you. You might not have licensing costs. There's a ton of costs that are you know, not incurred because it's so easy to get started and it's all abstracted away. You have things like increased security. Security breaches can be incredibly expensive, um, especially once they've already happened. And you have cheaper, easier scaling. So, to look at a couple of case studies out there, in this first case study, PayPal saw a four time increase in site speed after converting their site to Jamstack from an old monolithic architecture. Citrix moved their massive documentation site off of a monolith over to a Jamstack site powered by Netlify. It's now 65% less expensive than their legacy CMS in part because of those light licensing costs that I talked about earlier and far less infrastructure requirements and so on. They also saw increased performance, average server connection time improved by 57%. It's amazing. Smashing Magazine, who's here today and helping us run this um, wonderful conference, uh, made the move to Jamstack after learning that their site could be six times faster. And what we found was that the, f the time to first load dropped from 800 milliseconds to 80 milliseconds. Lodash, which you probably know, uh, went from a PHP stack to a, using a service worker to download load the entire site offline so that when you first visit it, everything is available to you offline then. And it also uses resource hints like prefetch, preconnect, preload, and pre-render. And something that I think is really interesting is that they also store the redirects in there. So even the redirects work offline, which is super cool. So if we look back at this, and see what rich experiences we, need, we can make now with such little configuration, it truly is dizzying what, how much we can accomplish. So my question is, with all of these tools at your fingertips and nothing in your way, what are you gonna build? Thank you. <laughs>